but unfortunately, it'll never happen. Crunch! Punches! And punches! And it's over! I think it's gonna be over. Aguero in big trouble against the ropes! I have to say, there seems an element of genuine hate between these two, Ambrose. For sure. I don't hate the man. Just imagine if you bought a ticket. Stop it, Frank. You can stop it any time. Castillo's in trouble. Weak steps in. And the fight is over. Oh! Welcome back to the Legendary Nights Podcast, Season 3, Episode Number 8, The Tale of Bobby Chicon and Raphael Lamont. A tale of two fighters which we've never covered before for any of our podcasts. It's a very exciting episode for us because in doing the research for episodes like this, we'll learn so much about these fighters from yesteryear that we've never had the opportunity to cover. And sometimes we've never had the opportunity to really watch a lot of their fights. So when this was put together, Johnston, we were really excited at the prospect of doing such a tale of guys that shared the ring more than once. Not just once, not just twice, not just three times, but on four separate occasions. Unbelievable. Unbelievable set of fights that we really wanted to bring the stories to you listeners because these are stories that we feel get forgotten about, which is why a lot of the stories that we bring to you for the season are all about these types of tales because you never get the opportunity to to hear about them unless you're a, an avid boxing historian. You're not really going to know about them. So this is why we love bringing these tales to you. I'm excited to do this, Johnson. Really excited to cover the tale of Chicon versus Lamont. Same here. It's, it's, again, it's one of those situations where when you start out sort of trying to learn the history of the sport and this is just one that, you know, the Bobby Chacon and Rafael Lemon fights are, you don't really know the ins and depths of them. And the fact that, you know, the lack of, there is no footage of the first fight. And then I think it's the third fight where you're missing a couple of rounds. So you have to sort of rely on literature and, and those that were around to describe certain elements of it. But as a whole, this is probably one of the best rivalries, boxing rivalries in boxing history. And I'm perfectly honest with you. The reason why we haven't done this earlier is the fact that is the slight lack of information determined to get it out for this season because we want to bring you the best rivalries in boxing that we've never really been able to cover before. And this is one of them. Trust me, guys. Fantastic full fight. I can't even tell you. You talk about the full fight normally is the failure fight. This is the best fight. It's insane. It's just everything about this just leads up to this full fight. And it is it's stunning. There's some sad shit in this as well, by the way. And, and some things that are said as well that may offend people. So, you know, we've got to put that out there. There might be things that you you find quite hard to listen to, but it's a great story. Though. We're going to do what we always do for the tales. We do the intertwining roads, give you some context of the backgrounds going into the fights and the fight descriptions. And I'm excited to do it. And we're going to start with Bobby Chacon, who was born to Mexican immigrants and grew up in Los Angeles, Pacoma, in the San Fernando Valley. Well, when he was only a few months old, his father actually abandoned the family. In his dad's absence, Chacon struggled to find his identity and spent his youth building a reputation as a street fighter. When in McClay Junior High, he continued to fight daily and carried a blackjack in his packed lunchbox. The oldest of seven children, his tearaway demeanour came to the forefront and he refused to comply with the rules at home. It was his move to San Fernando High that he began to make changes in his life. He was a good athlete, but an average student. However, Chacon still struggled to keep his anger bottled up, and he said, I was always smaller than the other kids. I couldn't stand being pushed around. When one of the bigger kids tried, it meant a fight. In 1968, while at San Fernando High, he met his wife-to-be, Valerie Jin, of Chinese and Irish descent. And it was love at first sight. He recalled when he was interviewed with Sports Illustrated, he said, I was having a party and I asked her if she wanted to go. We were never really apart after that. As soon as they hooked up, Chacon put his street fight into one side and concentrated on his new love, Valerie. Together, they watched fights from the Los Angeles Forum and the Olympic Auditorium on TV. And it was Valerie who suggested, you can do that. You know you can. Chacon reflected on that moment and said, I gave boxing a try because she asked me to. 
I went into Jimmy Flores' gym in Pacoma with long hair and jeans. They told me to come back the next day with a haircut and $5. I didn't have $5, so I went to work out in Rocky Lane's garage. I was down from £145 to £125 in just six weeks. So Bobby Shikani continued to work as a labourer at Lockheed and pondered getting a boxing licence himself. But then one day, in his own words, he said that Valerie called him and she said she was bringing my lunch and the licence was in the lunchbox. So she was adamant at getting him into the ring. Shikon eventually took his anger to Johnny Flores' boxing gym in Pacoima, where he worked with a future trainer who was Joe Ponce. And Shikon's amateur career was brief, but it was successful. And he remembered that I knocked out the first guys I faced in two rounds or less. By 1971, Bobby and Valerie were married. And the next year, he decided he was going to turn professional. He was actually given that nickname, Schoolboy, because of his youthful looks and his decision to enroll in college while in the early stages of his professional career. He actually studied physical education at the California State University in Los Angeles. And in his first year as a professional, he faced 15 opponents and he beat all of them, knocking all but one out and he didn't get more than 375 dollars for a fight until his 12th professional fight against a guy called Juan Montoya when he actually received his biggest purse which was a thousand dollars for his first 10 rounder now this was at the forum in Inglewood California on August the 21st 1972 and we got the ring magazine who described the action in the December 1972 issue and he said, making his maiden start as a main eventer, 19-year-old Bobby Chacon was far from impressive in halting Montoya in the eighth round. Chacon was a one-sided winner, but he couldn't deck Montoya. The bout was ended with Montoya taking too much punishment. So now we're going to jump on. We're going to jump on to Rafael Limon now, who we're going to jump way back and sort of then catch up. Now, he was born into poverty in a small town in the state of Taxcalala, and it, which was a two and a half hour drive from Mexico City. He actually assumed his father was an alcoholic soldier who actually bashed up his mum on a regular basis. Now, Limon actually told the Ring TV, which is a, a great art, uh, article with uh, ringtv.com. He says, my father was part of the Mexican military. So every weekend, the military guys had the chance to leave the base. He had, been, he had a drinking problem. My father used to beat my mother. She became tired of the constant beating, so fled as soon as she got the opportunity to do so. And Limon remembered. When I was about three or four years old, my mother decided to leave him. She took my two brothers, sister and me to live in Mexico City. Although now a single mother with four mouths to feed, she and the family settled into city life. Then one day when Limon was a teenager, he encountered a bizarre incident and he said, I remember when I was 15, I was walking on the street and a guy grabbed me and I threw a punch at him and ran to my house. A couple of minutes later, a man came to my house and I thought, this man is going to beat me. My mother stepped in and told me, he is your father. It was very confusing because my mother lived with another man. And I didn't know the other guy wasn't my biological father. It wasn't until then that I found out. Three years later, and Limon joined the army, which was an education, and he said the army taught me to be a gentleman, to take care of myself, my image, presentation, my timekeeping, and discipline. I appreciate that. I have never drunk, done drugs. I used to like women. That was my weakness. Now I only have my wife. It was in the army where he discovered that he was a natural in boxing. It started when he found it amusing that one of his soldier pals got busted up and was bleeding, so one of the senior officers told him to give it a go because he found it so funny. So he did, and he took to it like a duck to water. Three months later, he was sent to Kid Rapides, who was known as Alfredo Chavez, the Cuban trainer of Jose Napoli's. Limon had a very brief but active amateur career, fighting four to five times a month that lasted 10 months. Well, back to Bobby Chacon, and Bobby Chacon actually stopped a, a Mexican, Valente Vera, in the fifth round, which gave him the chance to take on the California State featherweight champion, who was Alberto Reyes, 
But unfortunately, both fighters came in over that featherweight limit, meaning that Reyes' title was not at stake. Chacon wore down the Filipino with body shots until the referee stopped it. He had two more impressive victories followed that against Frankie Crawford, who had a record of 38-16-5, and, and Chuncho Castillo, which is probably his biggest scalp at this point, 45-13-2 he was, which led to the undefeated Chacon, now 20 years of age and 19-0, and to step up a level. And boy, what a level against the former world bantamweight champion, Ruben Oliveres, 71-3-1 for his biggest payday of his career, which is actually $40,000 at the Forum in Inglewood. The Mexican had one of the most dangerous left hooks in the business, and his signature shot nearly broke his opponents in half. I mean, earning him the nickname as Rocker by Ruben for the adoring the Mexican, Mexican fans. Ruben Oliveres was no joke. The vacant NABF featherweight title was up for grabs, and a potential world title shot awaited the winner. Now, the Associated Press, they wrote this on the fight. So, Ruben Oliveres ruined the perfect record of local featherweight hero Bobby Chacon, scoring a ninth round knockout. Chacon appeared strong in the first two rounds, but Oliveres dramatically changed the complexion of the fight in the third and didn't lose another round. Oliveres knocked Chacon down with a straight right in the first 10 seconds of the ninth and then pounded the San Fernando fighter unmercifully for the remainder of the round. Now, during the intermission, Chacon's manager, Joe Ponce, asked referee Dick Young to stop the fight, which had been scheduled for 10 rounds. Joe Ponce obviously wanting to save his youngster for another day. Chacon credited his opponent's signature left hook, that devastating left hook after the fight. He said, those body shots were what really did me in. They had me hanging and gasping for breath. Oliveres, well... He felt that he had silenced his doubters at the time. He said, a lot of people thought I was washed up, but maybe they'll change their tune when I win the featherweight championship. After that devastating defeat to Olivares, Chacon managed to bounce back with four victories all by stoppage and force himself into contention for a shot at the WBC featherweight title. The brilliant Brazilian, Adair Joffrey, had been stripped of his title on June the 18th, 1974, for failure to defend following his fourth round knockout of the outstanding southpaw, Vincente Saldivar. For Chacon to get his chance at world title glory, he needed to defeat the undefeated Danny Little Red Lopez, who was 23-0, in sort of an elimination bout in the sports arena in Los Angeles, which was no mean feat. The Long Beach Press Telegram reported on the fight, and it said, A nearly full house. 16,027 and 2,671 closed circuit TV witnessed at the Olympic Auditorium a few blocks away saw Chacon win a classic battle between the Southland's two popular featherweights when referee John Thomas called a halt at 48 seconds of the ninth. Chacon had the situation in hand most of the way and he brought it to a sudden halt when he bolted from his corner to start the climatic round. He met Lopez in the centre of the ring with a heavy right that sent Lopez reeling towards the ropes, following up with two more rights on the left. Lopez would have gone down had he had not fallen onto the bottom strand, where he absorbed further punishment until slumping to the deck. He gamely tried to resume battle, but ran into another barrage and the final dynamite right that sent him onto the ropes on the opposite side of the ring. Teddy Bentham, Lopez's cornerman complained about Chacon's weight. 126 pounds, my ass. He may have weighed that at noon, but by fight time, I'll bet he was close to 131. But Danny Lopez was complimentary about Chacon and he said he was tough inside, a lot better than I thought he was. He didn't hurt me until he dropped me. Then he hurt me pretty good. You got a great performance and you can see that on YouTube. Stunning performance. The respect between the two obviously continued when Chacon actually told Lopez that you'll be back, Danny. I know you will. I'll have to admit I was pretty discouraged the night I lost to Oliveres, but I recovered and turned into a better fighter. You know, they always do. His losses always help. Tom was superb in one of the best performances of his career. And you can watch this fight on YouTube, as I said, and you will see Chacon demonstrate fast feet and power in his hands. Four months later, on September the 7th, 1974, less than two years into his professional career, 
Bobby Chacon got his chance to fight for that vacant WBC featherweight title against Alfredo Maracano, who was 43, 9 and 5. And of course, it was again at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. Now, in front of a crowd of six and a half thousand, referee Ray Solis of Mexico stopped the fight after Chacon knocked down the Venezuelan veteran with two booming right hands. And Maracon, he beat the count, but Solis said, uh, stop the fight because his eyes were glazed. At this point, Chacon was officially in his prime. Michael Katz of the New York Times actually wrote that he was magnificently innovative and able to invent punches in midair. In March of 1975, Chacon made his first defense of that title, knocking out Jesus Estrada in the second round, also again at the Olympic Auditorium. Definitely a home-from-home home venue for him. After the victory, Chacon selected himself, Ruben Oliveira, 79-5-1 for this time for his second total defence. He actually came in 14 pounds overweight two weeks before the fight because by his own admission, he was weakened by drugs and alcohol. His decision to sack Joe Ponce didn't help the situation either, gaining 20 pounds weeks before the fight. But by the time the weigh-in arrived, he tipped the scales a pound and a half under the weight limit. That dramatic weight loss, as we know, made him gaunt, which actually prompted Ruben Oliveres to grin at the weigh-in and say, Chacon said he was going to knock me out in three rounds. Well, I just saw him, and I'm going to knock him out in one or two. Chacon earned a record purse of more than $160,000 for a featherweight fight. And with it, he bought a mansion and some Bentleys. Now, this was during a time where there was an influx of South and Central American title holders during the, the mid-1970s. Of the 14 world champions in that decade, eight came from those regions. That summer, in the Oliveira's rematch, it was a complete shutout, with the Mexican making his prediction come true, stopping Chacon in the second round. Moving back to Rafael Lamont, who had found boxing a difficult business when he finished his amateur career of 41 wins and 5 defeats. During his brief time as an amateur, he unintentionally killed one of his opponents. It was at that moment that Limon realised just how dangerous the sport was, and he said, I hate it, it's awful. You can go blind, you can get killed, you can lose your marbles. The only reason I do it is for the money. It was during his amateur career that Limon was given his nickname, by his army major when he was describing Limon's power. He said it was like a bazooka, and the nickname stuck ever since. At the age of 18, Limon stepped into a professional ring for the first time on December the 5th, 1972, and stopped a fellow debutant by knockout. Limon then worked his way up the rankings in Mexico, which is one of the most difficult and dangerous circuits in boxing, and where only the strong survive. He fought a total of 27 times in three years, winning 20 and losing seven until he was brought in as an opponent for the now popular Bobby Chacon, who was looking for a layup to get his career back on track. Now, this is a good time to discuss the history of the rivalry between Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, also known as Chicanos. As we have already mentioned earlier, that Chacon was born in California, which made him a Chicano or a, he a Heiano, while Limon was from Mexico. Well, does the geography really matter? Well, southwest states like Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Nevada and California were actually originally part of that northern Mexico before the United States of America obviously took over those areas after the Mexican-American War. Now, why is it important? Well, this is the part of the rivalry. In a conflict... That lasted almost two years. The Mexican death tolls is believed to have reached something like 25,000 civilians, and the American death toll exceeded 13,000. So now, fast forward to the 1970s, and animosity between those two fractions had actually evolved into a sporting rivalry. And Latin Americans are proud of their Hispanic background. We don't know, with Oscar De La Hoya, we've done it. You know, that's, this is the, it was just a big thing for him. But many residents of Mexico do not welcome or understand why Hispanics mainly speak English, which sometimes led to resentment between each other. Now, with that demographic, with a sprinkle of many of the early fights between Mexicans and Mexican-American fighters, which often took place in the mecca of boxing for that particular rivalry, which was the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. 
But then their disputes were further heightened, basically. So by the time Bobby Chacon and Rafael Limon entered the ring in 1975, the boxing rivalry was already a passionate one. They first met on December the 7th in a Mexicali ball ring. Limon was 21 was a rising star in the boxing world. His slow telegraphed right hooks released from awkward ag- angles and his bushy afro and stalking style were all part of the appeal to that crafty but courageous southpaw from Mexico City. Whereas Chacon was 24 years of age, he was already a kid from the streets who had made it big. A West Coast legend, to some people may have explained him as, and a former world champion and the favourite going into this fight. Now, this was supposed to be a tune-up fight. We have to make that clear. This was a tune-up fight for Bobby Chacon, who actually told Mark Heisler of the Los Angeles Times, I thought I was fighting a bum in Mexicali. I did. I happened to be worse than the bum. So you get an idea of how this is going. Although those sentiments were true, it was still a fight where both had a lot at stake. Both had uh, well-tile aspirations. In their new weight, they were moving up a weight. Now, this is the new weight they moved up from from before. And now this is the junior or the super lightweight division. Well, there was no build-up. Only little snippets of the fight in black and white. And there were very limited reports about this first fight. The general consensus of the fight was that it was fought at a quick pace from the beginning, with both throwing quick combinations from the start. The two boxers did not slow down fighting at close quarters. The two boxers hit each other with strong punches down the stretch, leaving most boxing fans with the desire to see them fight again. There were no knockdowns in the fight, and Limon was given the 10-round decision. The Los Angeles Times reported that the Mexican had won 7 of the 10 rounds, the counter punching Chacon repeatedly and leaving him swollen. The win for Rafael Limon put him on the map. And he was finally being talked about as a genuine contender. And not just a flash in the pan. In his next fight on February the 1st, 1976, Le Mans battered fellow Mexican Vicente Blanco all over the ring. He was angry because Blanco's manager said that his win over Chacon meant nothing because Chacon was a shot fighter. After punishing Blanco for his manager's disrespectful words over 10 rounds, Le Mans walked over to the corner of his opponent and punched Blanco's manager in the face and growled, Now your fighter is shot. He went on to make his American debut and win his next four bouts before taking a faded former world champion from Australia, Lionel Rose, at the Forum in Inglewood, California. The fight was televised on August the 28th and was on the undercard of legendary Mexican warrior Carlos Cerate. The United Press International wrote, Limon dropped Rose twice in the second and again in the third. After the third knockdown, referee George Latka immediately halted the fight. In another televised appearance in America, he knocked out Teriyoshi Noje in two rounds and went on the longest winning streak of his career. And I suppose it's important to add a bit of context to this first fight. It probably feels to everybody listening like, you know, we've just completely skimmed over this particular fight. Not the case. Unfortunately, there was very limited information. As Johnston, you rightly pointed out at the start of the episode, the information is so few and far between. Even looking around for snippets from different newspapers, you can't get actual footage of the first fight. You can only get literature. And that is where we've been able to take this information regarding the first fight. But just discussing it just for a moment, on the limited information provided, it's really a huge moment that started this rivalry off because Chacon was expecting it to be a walkover and Limon goes and beats him and he beats him and it puts Limon on the map but this really was only just the beginning of what was going to be one of the best boxing rivalries of all time it was it it sparked it I mean the fact is the beauty of it is we know we get four fights you get three of them online you can watch them on YouTube as I say the second we'll go through those fights in a lot more detail but it just it, it created this buzz now, obviously Le Mans has it's inspired him. It really has. And how many times have we seen that where, you know, you think it's going to be a layup and how many times have they been Mexicans, Sean? The Mexicans, especially those that have been fighting on the circuit, just because he lost five times in Mexico, you just do not over-exaggerate. You can't, un- un- I mean, you can't underestimate, sorry, that level of opponents he's been fighting and it showed. 
So still sticking with Limon now since his victory over Shikon. He won 23 out of 24 fights. He knocked out 15 and won the vacant NABF Super Featherweight title. So, you know, he's no joke. However, his team did try to actually negotiate with the representatives of the WBA champion at the time. It was Samuel Serrano. But the fight, for whatever reason, just never materialized. The only blemish on his record was actually a disqualification loss to Aurelio Nunes in Mexico. Now, we're not quite sure why he was disqualified, but the description of Limon's style by ring journalist Christopher Coates might just give us a slight idea. And this is what he said. He said, when he wrote that he was, as in Limon, an accomplished dirty fighter with a God-given talent, honed to the perfection with diligent practice, a thumbing, butting, hitting on the break, and he is not at all squeamish about aiming a solid punch at the inside seam of an opponent's trunks. Other fighters occasionally try these tactics, but the bazooka man really puts his heart into it. <laughs> you can see where he's, he, he roughs you up. Now, while Limon was heading in the right direction, the defeat was damaging for Bobby Chacon, who we'll move to now, and who was widely expected to obviously deal with the tough Mexican. But after, he was actually now on the brink of withdrawal from the sport altogether. Three fights later, on February the 25th, 1976, against a cl club fighter named David Sotelo, Chacon was knocked down twice and took a beating that left him battered, bloodied and nearly unconscious, but he managed somehow to take a grueling decision victory. His purse was $4,500, was not enough to compensate for the pain he had endured in the ring, which forced Valerie to tears. She went into his dressing room in the Olympic Auditorium and pleaded him to retire after this fight, and he agreed. Valerie actually told reporters on the scene at the time, boxing was something he was good at, but something he's done for long enough. But as we know, he would return, and he would also retire a few more times too along the way. Valerie grew fearful of what might happen to her husband, and was also concerned about his behaviour outside of the ring. Chacon said she thought no one loved her, she wanted me to sit down and love her. Valerie was a homebody. I fooled around and she left. I promised I'd give up playing around to get her back. Val was always home with the babies and never got the chance to develop her head. It wasn't long before Chacon was on the comeback trail in late 1976, but it turned into a circus with postponements delaying his return to the ring. He got a bad case of the flu, tumbled out of the ring during a sparring session and broke his arm on the floor. Chacon told Los Angeles Times columnist Jack Horn, It seems like I've tried to bullshit my way. I don't care what it seems like. I really want to fight. Finally, Chacon did make his return to the ring at the age of 24, now under the guidance of Eddie Futch and with a career record of 30 wins and only three defeats. He fought six times from the end of 1976 until the summer of 1977, winning all by knockout. Those wins set up a third fight with Ruben Oliveres, who was now 82-8-1 at the Forum in California. But despite losing the first two, Chacon was the betting favourite at 8-5 going into that third fight. The Independent Press-Telegram described the action. Ruben Oliveres isn't what he used to be, but he was still something more than a pushover. Chacon was credited with a knockdown in the second round when he threw his first decent combination and followed with a left to Ruben's belly that sat Oliveira's on his rump. Chacon admitted after the fight, it wasn't a knockdown. He was slipping when I hit him in the stomach. Well, the press telegram, they continued with their description. He said by the fifth round, Oliveira's his footwork was plodding and his punches were slow motion. Although his great heart continued to carry the fight to Chacon, who won by unanimous decision. Eddie Futch actually said afterwards that at first our plan was to take the initiative and force Ruben back so he would tire. We thought maybe his old legs might be shaky, but Ruben offset that by boring in and throwing his bombs. A, t a terrific, we've got to do a career profile on Ruben Oliveira. What a fighter he was. So out of the $50,000 for the fighters, Shikon actually took home the largest share, which was $30,000. Definitely a lot more money than the four and a half grand he took for taking a punishing win. And Oliveira's took $20,000. Well, 
On the back end of the final win, Shakon had hoped he could shoot another world title opportunity. However, it was quickly halted when he lost a split decision to Arturo Leon just three months later. After another break from the ring, he returned to record three wins in 1978 and a fourth early in the new year, which meant that Shakon and Le Mans crossed paths once again in 1979 for their eagerly anticipated rematch. The Bobby Chacon and Rafael Leon rematch actually took place on April 4, 1979 at the Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena and was scheduled for 12 rounds because the NABF Super Featherweight or the Junior Lightweight, whatever you want to call it, that title was at stake. But perhaps more importantly, the winner would have the opportunity to fight Alexis Arguello, the WBC Junior Lightweight title. There was the first bit of animosity between the pair when the Los Angeles Times vaguely reported that during the pre-fight build-up, Chicana publicly questioned Limon's manhood and courage. And Limon, literally, this is what it said, Limon had responded with angry words. I mean, we would love to know what those angry words were, but we couldn't give them to you. The referee and judge were Lou Filippo, and the other two judges were Larry Rosadelia and Bobby Rings. In front of a crowd of just over 8,000, Chacon was 27, was introduced by the master of the ceremonies as just over 129 pounds and the reigning number two in the world. Limon 25 was presented at 129 and a quarter pounds as the number one in the world and the NABF super featherweight champion who wants Aguayo next. Now their rematch can be viewed on YouTube and has been described by some as the best rematch in boxing history. So now we're going to go into a breakdown of this particular fight. Rounds one and two, the pair met in the centre ring and immediately went to war. South Paul Limon tried to land some big looping left hands. Chacon worked well behind his jab, tried to get in close and connect with his right hand to the head or chest. Towards the end of the first, Limon forced Chacon into the neutral corner and landed some hard left hands as the crowd began to cheer. Merdy go, merdy go. But then, the Chicano came fighting back with a flurry of left and rights, forcing Limon into retreat. Into the second and both fighters had their successes. Chacon continued to work his left jab in search of the right and opened the brighter landing one-twos while evading Limon's attacks. The Mexican was pushed back to the ropes and was forced to clinch, resulting in a few rabbit punches from Chacon. The referee, Lou Filippo, imposed his authority for the first time in the fight and gave Chacon a stern warning. The last minute of the round exploded as both fighters began to throw with more intent. First it was Lemon who finally backed his man onto the ropes and kept him there long enough to unload a powerful combination. A short left and right both connected on Chacon's jaw while he tried to duck, dodge and weave away from his advances as the Mexicans in attendance cheered. But right at the end of the second, Chacon came roaring back with his own beautifully timed right and left that pushed Limon back and brought a loud cheer from his devoted followers. So great style. It really is just in these fights. It's just pure energy. Round three and four. Limon came out for the first with a ruthless intent and on a few occasions landed his explosive right hand. But it was his bazooka left that actually caught Chacon on the top of his cranium and made his legs buckle. Limon sensed his initiative and stalked his man around the ring, trying to patiently find the room to unload. But Bobby was smart and he kept away long enough to clear his head. Raphael was taking a clear round and looking for a powerful headshot. However, Chacon found a gap and he unleashed a big right hand bang on his chin, which made Limon back up. The tide turned for the remainder of the round as Chacon landed a couple more hard and effective rights. The first three rounds were fought at a fast pace, with Chacon slightly ahead on the judges' scorecards. As the fourth round started, Bobby Chacon came out looking the fresher and took a comprehensive round. His fainting and switching of the angles and distances was superb. He made Limon miss regularly and landed some brilliant one-twos with lefts and rights, while landed solid body shots that left the Mexican bewildered. Although, as usual with these two warriors, he did have his moments late in the round, but not enough scoring shots that affected Chacon, who claimed he had trained harder for this fight than any other, and the results 
of less partying were clearly evident because Shakon starts to really go through a great flow and a great motions in this fight now. We're into rounds five and six and the upright Mexican was clearly lacking the answers to the rejuvenated Shakon who refused to allow Limon to find any kind of groove, whereas Bobby was demonstrating his excellent boxing ability. Shakon was up on his toes, changing the angles and mixing his shots to the head and body, while Limon looked tired and powerless to make any dent in Chacon's advances. An excellent four-punch combination from Bobby pushed Limon from one side of the ring to another and compelled him to clinch. Something had to change for Limon in the six as the fight was beginning to look comfortable for Chacon. The crowd sensed it too, as the chants of Barbie, Barbie, Barbie echoed through the arena. That inspired Chacon to successfully put the pressure on. Who? Now was the aggressor while Limon looked fatigued and held on to a chorus of boos. Unable to keep up with the pace that Bobby had set, Limon retreated throughout much of the round to the disappointment of the crowd while Chacon stalked. To be fair, Limon, he had started bleeding from a cut over his right eye which the referee noticed and intervened to allow Dr. Bernhardt Schwartz to inspect the cut. It gave the Mexican the time to gain some vital seconds of recuperation and stem the one-sided flow of the fight. It worked momentarily as he pushed Shikon into the neutral corner and unloaded to the head and body, but he was unable to sustain that pressure and he was backed up once again with a solid right from Bobby. After some grappling, Lamont was warned for thumbing Shikon in the eye as the bell sounded. So into the seventh and the seventh never really got going, to be fair. So we will use a description from the Associated Press to finish off their rematch because that's is how it ends. And, and the bout was actually halted after the pair bumped heads unintentionally. A bad cut over the right eye of Limon was examined once again by Dr. Bernard Schwartz, who recommended to the referee, Lou Filippo, that the fight should be stopped. And Chacon had a substantial lead on the cards when the bout ended. Judged to have been an accidental headbutt from Chacon, the California State Athletic Commission stipulated that the contest should be ruled a draw and a technical draw was announced. Bobby, or today, Bobby Chacon, would have won by a technical decision because he was up on the cards. This is what the rules back then. Tally after two fights stood at one win for Limon and one draw, although it would, should have really been a defeat. So a third match was always inevitable and a sign of what was to come in this fierce rivalry. They both battled hard, but due to Bobby's tactics, this was n not a war at all. It was quite simply, it ended in a ceasefire. Now, with the WBC sanctioning uh, that Alexis Arguel faced the winner for the Chicon Limon rematch and the fight ended in a draw, they decided now what they would do rather than have the third fight. They wanted Lexus to obviously have defend his title. So the number one in the world rankings would now be given that opportunity. And that number one fighter was Rafael Limon, who by this point had a record of 43 wins, eight defeats and two draws with 30 of those going by way of knockout. He met the brilliant Aguero at Madison Square Garden's felt forum on July 8, 1979. Now, Aguero was defending the WBC Junior Lightweight title for the fifth time at the Garden and was favoured to beat the 25-year-old challenger. Boxing journalist Steve Farhood explained how this fight was not just the world title fight and how it had also become quite political. Farhood remembered, I covered the Bazooka Limon and Alexis Arguello fight, which was the fight where they carried that flag into the ring. So in a way, it was more of a political event rather than a prize fight. As I remember it, it was the start of a civil war in Nicaragua, but we didn't know anything about what was going on there in Nicaragua. So the flag wasn't as much of an element in the US. And he, Arguello, came into the ring with the flag. But we didn't know much. We thought he was just making a patriotic statement for his country. We vaguely knew, but no one understood the depth of what was occurring there. Lemon was an awkward fighter whose petulant nature and persistence either aroused or infuriated his opponents. However, to the Mexicans that packed in the garden, he represented something much different. Dr. Roman, 
who worked with Arguello, said Mexicans loved their boxers more than their families. Bazooka was supposed to have bazookas in both hands, but that was only according to Mexicans. That evening, Lemon didn't disappoint. Whether it was jumping in with hooks and jabs or going in head first, he showed his intentions early, but midway through the first round, Lemon stopped punching, dabbing his right eye with his glove and pleaded with the referee, Tony Perez, that he was intentionally headbutted. As usual, Aguayo, forever the gentleman, waited for Perez to notify broadcaster Howard Cassell and ringside journalist that there was no but before resuming the action. Even though he was clearly bothered by the cut, Limon earned Aguayo's respect during the second round, demonstrating his strength, but he became overzealous in the next round. Aguayo caught Limon with a left hook and right hand that stumbled the challenger across the ring and forced him to clinch for survival. Aguayo took control of the fight as Limon's frustrations came to the surface when he stopped midway through the fifth to complain about yet another headbutt. Limon was cut open again underneath his left eye, but pushed on to cut Aguero's right eye. While both fighters jabbed away, the fans cheered the magnificent brawl. And the Associated Press writer Skylar actually wrote that there was a mass of blood. Bazooka was a dirty fighter known for using his head, and Alexis knew it. He just got his head in first. He, as in Limon, would stand up, and boy, he could punch. But Limon never panicked. I think it hurt him when they moved the bouts from 15 to 12 rounds because those five rounds were his territory. Targeting the cup, Aguero actually drenched Limon in his own blood, who showed glimpses of his punching power, but not enough to win the rounds. Instead, the crowd watched on as the Mexican challenger began to kill the pace. Although the ring doctor let the fight continue in the later rounds, Limon's corner man couldn't stop the blading, and it poured down his yellow trunks, Blinded him completely and only worsened with four rounds to go. And in the 11th round, Aguero actually penetrated the mask of blood with two rights to reopen the cut after they had closed it. Referee Tony Perez, and eventually it had to be stopped. I mean, you can see this fight again. It is <laughs> he's covered in blood. He steps in, stops the fight in 1 minute 40 of the round. And Aguero comfortably ahead on all three of the cards at the time. And obviously stops the fight. Aguero actually recalls as well that Bazooka Lamont was pushing up my Adam's apple. He was squeezing out of desperation. A wounded animal had to find something to do. I thought he was a dirty fighter. He was just trying to survive. And Lamont actually responded to that criticism saying that I was hit harder down in Mexico on my way up the ladder. Well, it was time for Lamont to get back on that ladder. And it began with a decision victory after this defeat to end 1979. And by the new year, it would be their third match with Limon and Chacon. Limon was bitterly disappointed to be stopped by Arguello. His excuse for defeat was, I met a nice Filipino girl and didn't train right. I don't want to make excuses, but I was addressing other business instead of training. Now, Bobby Chacon was a maturing 27-year-old with a boyish smile and a cowboy swagger who took a unanimous decision the month before Limon Arguello against Jose Torres at the sports arena in Los Angeles, California. And it was a win that put Chicon into a position to challenge Alexis Arguello in his next fight. Bobby said after his victory, I learned my lesson tonight. No more goofing around. I'm going to stay in shape from now on. I was pooped. I just ran out of gas and was coasting in the last two rounds. He certainly needed to make sure he was in the shape of his life because he was fighting a legend and one of, if not the best 130 pounder that ever lived for the WBC Super Featherweight title. The date was confirmed for September 15th to take place at the Inglewood Forum in California, but it was postponed when Chacon suffered an injury. The match's uncertainty irritated Arguello and those associated with the fight due to issues within the Chacon camp. On September 26th, Arguello learned that Chacon again could not fight and when Don Fraser, the foreign promoter, could not find a suitable replacement, the card was cancelled. The California State Athletic Commission had suspended Chacon for pulling out of the September date, but by mid-October, he was back in the gym and awaiting confirmation of a November date. 
Reports circulated on October the 10th that the fight would finally take place at the Inglewood Forum on November the 16th. By that point, Los Angeles Times journalist Richard Hoffer felt Chacon had as much credibility as the Great Pumpkin. With the numerous postponements, the fight had lost its shine amongst the fans and suffered financially when it was pulled from ABC's wide world of sports. So the promoter Dom Fraser, who had been aware of issues and excuses that all sorts of boxers have come up with prior to this title fight, however, he was exhausted, he was just full of exhaustion he suffered in arranging the inevitable Aguero and Chacon fight and it tested his faith in the sport and he said it took me two years, two postponements, two nervous breakdowns just to get Aguero and Chacon in the same town and same ring in the same year. After being fined $5,000 for the postponements, Bobby Chacon went through the motions at the main street gym in Los Angeles. While Aguero had dominated opponents unlike any featherweight in recent memory, he couldn't match the popularity of the local boy, Chacon. The fan favourite had uh, never faced a man in as technically good, technically gifted as the skilled Nicaraguan. The contest between the two lacked hostility in the build-up and promoter Dan Cargin, actually so the other promoter of this, is a couple of promoters, but Dan Cargin actually said there was no animosity between the two guys. It was tough to get mad at Aguero. He wasn't a guy to pop off. Bobby was just being Bobby, a happy kid. And you never know what he was going to say. He was always, with everybody, one of the most popular guys there. Now, when Chicon finally entered the Inglewood Forum on November the 16th, 1979, the crowd gave the local kid an extended ovation. Both Aguayo 59 and 5 with 51 knockouts and Chicon 42, 4 and 1 with 37 knockouts weighed less than a pound under the 130 limit nearly 11,200 fans filled the forum for a gate for just over 165,000 with Aguero taking home 110 and Chacon 35,000 not not bad money for him but ESPN actually aired the live broadcast for this which was a coup because of the upstart station had only recently launched its first program two months earlier the fight started with Chacon circling while Aguayo stood his ground, popping off his jab. Chacon continued dancing as the chant of Bobby, Bobby came from the crowd. Chacon was a classifier, but it didn't take long for the sublime Aguayo to figure him out. The powerful counter left hook was the money shot as the Nicaraguan took the first two rounds, but Chacon showed his class and outgunned Aguayo for the next two rounds. Few men were brave enough to stand in front of the champ and trade. But the aging Chacon showed that he could beat him at his own game, outboxing Arguello and outslugging him. By the sixth, Chacon was significantly ahead on the judges' scorecards, but in the seventh, a left hook sent him to the canvas. Chacon rose at the count of five, went back down at six and was up again at eight. Chacon was caught in the corner and absorbed several sharp left hooks as blood flowed freely from a two-inch gash on his right eye. Referee John Thomas stopped the action and requested for Dr. Roger Thill to look. A determined Chacon made it through the round, but he never threw another punch. Thomas called the fight while Chacon was sat on his stool between round seven and eight. Arguello then sang Chacon's praises after the fight by saying, Chacon is a good fighter. He is a real intelligent guy. He knew what he had to do out there. He has a really good style. He fought his hardest. I told everyone it was going to be a tough fight, and it was. Chacon conceded. The guy's dangerous all the time. I saw him sitting back, just waiting. I knew he'd come out sooner or later. Well, he's the champ, all right. I guess he showed why. I had the right strategy. A few punches were bound to get in, and the ones that did were good ones. I have nothing to be ashamed of. It was the cut that did me in. After the loss to Arguello, Valerie insisted that the family move from San Fernando Valley to Palermo, 65 miles north of Sacramento. Alan Jin, one of Valerie's three brothers, had bought a 40 acres of land outside town and he actually sold 20 of them to Bobby and Valerie. They moved into a double-wired mobile home on the property in 1980. Chacon was willing to take another stab at world glory. 
with the aim of having enough money to provide for his family. But to do that, he needed another top contender. Limon had never been a world champion and his aspirations of fulfilling his dreams were still burning. The fight that made most sense was a third fight with one another. And victory would provide a world title opportunity. By the time they agreed to fight that third fight, their rivalry had developed into a genuine disliking for one another. She can't explain their rivalry with KO Magazine. Well, it's all personal. I didn't like Bazooka at all. It developed after our second fight when he was telling people that I was a dirty fighter. To begin with, his big thing was how he beat Bobby Chacon for the first time and he mouthed off and stuff. Even before the fight, he said I was washed up. It would be an easy fight for him. He was asked for his opinion on Limon as a fighter. Through gritted teeth, Chacon credited the Mexican for his strength. But then asked about his speed, he said it takes him about four minutes to throw a punch. Mark Hesler of Los Angeles Times actually gave his opinion on the up-and-coming third match. They'll hold grudge fight number two Friday night in the forum. Latest in Bobby Chacon Bazooka Limon series. It's actually their third fight, but only the second time that hatred has entered in. The first time they fought, they didn't know anything about each other. The trilogy fight took place at the Forum in Inglewood, California on March the 21st, 1980. John Thomas was the referee and third judge. The other two judges was Marty Denkin and Frank Rustic. Bobby Chacon was 42-5-1, aged 28, and Southpaw Raphael Lamon was 44-9-2, and, and he was two years younger. Although the third fight is on YouTube, the action only actually begins from round three with brief action shots of Limon landing on Chicon as ESPN show a replay of a moment in the second round. So the fight reports on the first two rounds are non-existent and the judges' full cards were never published. So we're actually struggled to be able to provide anything from that first particular round. What we do know is that they picked up from where they left off previously in their bouts and entered into another vicious brawl, which we will try to give it that value and justice. So into that third round, and Chacon comes out early in the third, once again working behind that jab, pushing Limon back, who evades by switching the angle and coming back with his own shots. It's Chacon who lands the most telling shot at the beginning of the round, an overhand right catching Raphael bang on the chin, Neither fighter wanted to give away any ground as they battled for the centre of the ring. Bobby lands a telling right uppercut but Limon fires back with a flurry. It's all action, as the commentator suggests. I don't think either one of them will be able to go 10 rounds at this pace. And rounds 4 and 5 and, and Chacon takes the initiative but he's forced back to the ropes by the Mexican who unloads a barrage of punches to the head and body. Some do get through but Bobby does well to deflect a majority. The action moves back to the centre of the ring and Chacon lands a big right hand that hurts Limon and his legs buckle, forcing him to hold on. As Bobby forces the fight and continues to unload on a dazed nemesis, it's Limon that shows amazing powers of recovery and comes fighting back with a combination while Chacon is on the ropes. Amazingly, in a stunning round of non-stop action, Chacon comes firing back as they exchange blow for blow to the sound of the bell. Limon took the centre of the ring from the start of the fifth and it wasn't long before Chacon forced him back with a big right hand. Although Limon once again came back with plodding jabs opened a cut on Bobby's left eye. The round was fought for much of the round in the centre of the ring but Bazooka took control and landed with flurries while manhandling the crowd favourite. Round six and seven and Limon controlled much of the sixth round keeping Chacon in a neutral corner and unloading on him. The Mexican looked the fresher. When Chacon did push him back briefly, it spurred chants again of Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. The seventh had the same pattern of Raphael forcing Chacon into a corner and unloading. This time he put a combination together to the head and body while Chacon covered up with his back against the ropes. Bobby attempted to trade with Lamont, but he was caught with a solid right hand and he hit the canvas. He was back on his feet within a couple of seconds and took the standing eight count. Limon threw everything at Chicon, 
in hope of stopping him as the referee watched on eagerly, but he survived and returned to his corner, covered in blood. Rounds 8 and 9 and Limon's punch output in the 8th was much less than the previous rounds, which helped Chacon to land more often, even though he was on the back foot. As each fighter prepared to come out for round 9, it was a commentator on Jude that cast his opinion on how he was actually scoring the fight. And he said Limon, with the only knockdown of the fight in the 7th round and probably winning most of the other rounds, Bazooka Limon should have a pretty comfortable lead. That's just an unofficial opinion because I don't know of what the three officials have scored it. Limon landed a big powerful right hand with the very first punch of the, of, of the ninth but didn't do much more until the last 30 seconds. But with Shakon now with a left eye and bridge of his nose bleeding, he just literally pot shotted his way through the round, landing the cleaner and effective right hands to, as, as Limon basically just took that round off. And now into round 10 and before the bell sounded for the 10th and last time chants of Barbie, Barbie, Barbie came from the pro Chacon crowd and it echoed around the arena. This was another exceptional round from these two warriors. It swung from one fighter to the other in a close round that could have gone either way. But it was Chacon who probably just edged it. While the Mexican was unloading another one of his onslaughts, he was countered and knocked back on his heels. Bobby sensed his opportunity to score a knockdown, but Limon hadn't hit the deck once in 27 rounds between these two. He certainly wasn't going to do now when he was on the verge of victory. As the bell rang, the fighters embraced, and from the reaction of both fighters, it was Limon who held his hands in the air, expectant of getting the decision. The commentator revealed that he had Limon winning by six clear points, and that there was no suspense about the decision. After 10 back and forth rounds, the judges were divided on the scorecards, with Marty Denkin favouring Limon, 96-94. However, he was overruled by judges Don Thomas and Frank Rustic, who awarded Chicon his hard-earned revenge, scoring the contest 96-95 each. I mean, you watch the fight, I feel Limon wins this fight. Um, it's definitely a... A, a not great decision despite having been on the deck and, and leaving the fight wearing a mask as well because of his nose Bobby Chacon was awarded the, the decision squeaking past Limon via a split decision that could be counted as one of the few incidents of good fortune that he had since gloving up again I mean he has been a bit unfortunate this was definitely a fortunate one for him it was considered a robbery and Limon said after through interpreters it was the worst robbery of my life he even indicated that he showed remorse and stayed away from Chacon's left eye because it looked so bad. Valerie decided to spend the evening with friends in a local bar rather than actually watch the fight from ringside. But she could not escape the footage being shown on television, which was being shown in the bar she was at. What she saw first was Limon's relatively unmarked face. But when she saw her husband, Bobby, with two swollen eyes and, and, a, and a cut nose and just his face in a mask. When she actually met up with Bobby after the fight, she told him that I can't take it anymore. Please, you have to stop. Bobby didn't stop. We did stop for a year in a way. So jumping to Limon, and due to this, it was Limon who, six months later, got a world title shot because obviously he was in retirement now against the WBC super featherweight champion, Idelfonso Beverly. And the title had actually been vacated now by Alexa, Alexis Aguero. It actually moved up in weight. And this was Limon's 58th professional fight. fight. And he finally managed to capture his first world title. While ahead on the scorecards, he actually stopped the Venezuelan in the 15th and final round at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. Limon made his first defense of the title against the brilliant Uganda Brit Cornelius Boza Edwards. Tensions were high after Limon made a distasteful comment to Bowser Edwards. Four months earlier, British fighter Johnny Owen died after being knocked out by Mexican fighter Lupe Pintor, and Limon said, that's what happens to British fighters when they fight Mexicans. The fight was another thrilling contest, where the Mexican was put down in the fifth round with a well-timed straight left, but he got up and fought on, the only way he knew how, with ferocity. 
The mum was exhausted by the championship rounds, holding his hands low and throwing pot shots to fend off Bowser Edwards' advances. But then Limon, out of nowhere, gets his second wind and fights hard for the last two rounds. These final few rounds demonstrate the class of Bowser Edwards as he faints, drops the Ali shuffle, delivers bolo punches to the body and waves the Mexican in for more exchanges, leaving him reeling. The final minute of the 14th round is fought toe-to-toe as they tee off on each other in a super and absorbing fight that you can catch on YouTube. You will see them embrace one another at the end of the fight, but Bowser Edwards is given the decision and was the worthy winner. Limon disagreed, saying he deserved the decision and that he hadn't trained. However, his own trainer, Arturo Hernandez, opposed his opinions. Cornelius Bowser Edwards said, He hit me below the belt many times. He's the dirtiest fighter I've ever faced. But while Limon won the WBC title only to lose it again in his next fight, Bobby Chacon returned from retirement in 1981 and reunited with Joe Ponce. He kick-started the year with two stoppage wins at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles. Those back-to-back victories gave him the chance to fight the new super featherweight champion, Cornelius Bowser Edwards, in his first defence since winning the title against Rafael Lamont. I'll tell you what, these fights are crazy. The Bowser Edwards, Limon, Chacon, Barate, oh, it's just insane. If, if you haven't seen any of these fights, they'll pretty much fight each other. It's, it's, just, it's just immense. So the fight was actually held at the Showboat Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas on May 30th, 1981. And here is what the Associated Press wrote. So Cornelius Bowser Edwards retained the WBC Super Featherweight title, battering Bobby Chacon until the challenger's manager asked that the fight be stopped after the 13th round. Chacon scored well in the first six. His best round was the fourth, when he and the champion stood toe-to-toe in the centre of the ring and battered each other with a dozen, dozens of punches, is pretty much what it was. Chacon had never been past 10 rounds before, and this fight was his first. The Associated Press continued with their report and they said that with Chacon tiring, the fight belonged to Bowser Redwoods from the fourth on. The final three rounds of the fight appeared to be almost in slow motion as the champion put the weary Chacon on the ropes and batted him with dozens of short, crisp punches to the head and the body. The tactic obviously intended to wear Dan Chacon worked well. Referee Carlos Podida stopped the fight at the request of Chacon's manager. The United Press International actually reported after the defeat that in the history of prize fighting, there have been a handful of fighters who gave up the brutal sport without receiving a bloody reminder of their fading skills. Bobby Chacon isn't one of them. He decided to fight again before the year was out, forcing Augustin Rivera to retire in, in the sixth. He was just an average fighter. While Chacon was actually away, Valerie's mother, May, would visit Valerie, who had now fallen into a depression. Now, Bob Husky, a family friend, said that she felt bad all the time, not just around his fights. Bobby was taking a lot of punishment. Valerie felt guilty. She had gotten him into fighting, and now she couldn't justify it in her mind. The win over Limon and losses to both Aguayo and Bowser Edwards, which ended in bloody stoppages, were harrowing to both Chacon and Val, who pleaded once again for him to quit boxing. But rather than quit and then return later, he refused. By all accounts, Valerie had become paranoid, and to Chacon's own admission, she was afraid, so she made me buy her a rifle. She'd say, Bobby, we've got to fence this place in. She knew how to use the rifle. I had taught her. Then in February 1982, Valerie attempted suicide while Chacon was in Sacramento, stopping Renan Marata on cuts. He recalled, She pleaded with me not to go. She was weak looking. She took sleeping pills. She told our daughter, Jonah, Now I'm going to lock this bedroom door. Don't you let anyone bother me. Jonah, then 11, obeyed her mother. After a while, Jin came over and asked for Valerie when he couldn't open the bedroom door. He took it off his hinges and rescued his sister. Chacon recalled that she got mad at the hospital when she woke up and found out that she wasn't dead. She ripped the tubes out of her arm and walked out. 
she disappeared. I suppose she thought I had something going on the side. Valerie went missing for a month until she was found wandering around the airport at Sacramento mumbling about guns. Chacon told the New York Times, When I came to get her, she looked beautiful like always. I never even thought about her seeing a psychiatrist. Never. I wouldn't do that. She had lost 20 pounds between January and March. She just wanted me to get out of boxing. And I wanted to get out. But I went to Sacramento to get ready to fight Salvador Ugalde. We talked on the phone and we argued. Then on Monday, March 15, five days after Valerie was found at the airport, Chacon recalled that her mother, May, called him and said, Bobby, Val's acting real funny. Several minutes later, May called again and Bobby recollected. He said, it sounded like she was laughing. She was hysterical. She said, Bobby, Val's shot herself. Sam Roberts for the New York Times explained what happened in the article, in his article, and he said, the rifle at home was usually not loaded because May was afraid of guns. But before Chacon left to fight, Valerie asked him to load it for her protection, and he did. She, as in Valerie, made one last phone call to Bobby, and in a little afternoon on March 15, Valerie kissed her children's pictures, locked the bedroom door, placed the barrel of a loaded rifle against her head and pulled the trigger. After May told Chacon what happened, he all but burned up the engine of the old, old mobile's Amiga, speeding from Sacramento to Palermo. And that was the article, and that's how he explained what happened. Now, Bobby somehow did manage to recall the moment he arrived in the bedroom at the mobile home, and he said, I couldn't believe how much blood I turned her over, saw the hole. Alan was the one who had found her, taken her last breaths. When I saw her, she looked as beautiful to me as ever. She left behind three children, Jonah, Bobby Jr., also known as Chico, and Jamie. After his wife's suicide, Chacon told the New York Times she was tired of being a boxer's wife. She just wanted to be my wife, not my trainer. She was always on me about it but boxing was something i had to do to get it out of my blood the next night he was back in sacramento for the fight against salvador Yelgaldi. believe it or not the next night the ring physician who was uh dr pb Mon montimaya actually checked chacon's blood pressure before the fight and apparently it remained low dr montimaya told herb mickelson of the sacramento b I could not even say Bobby was in grief. The fight was all I think he had on his mind. Alan and Valerie's father, James Jin, were in Chacon's corner that night. Alan stayed with Chacon and spoke to the press for him. Chacon said he asked James if he should fight and James replied, let's fight and get it over with. Bobby added he loved Val so much. He said that she came back to him in a dream. Chacon fought for a $6,000 purse and knocked out Ugaldi in the third round. He cried in the ring afterwards and said, I said I'd quit in my next loss or within a year, whichever came first. But not now. I've got to keep on fighting to go through with my career. Boxing, I'm going to treat like another marriage. A few days later, Chacon contemplated suicide so he could be with his wife, holding a gun in despair and trembling, finger on the trigger. He thought of his kids and knew there was still something to live for. Years later, he told a reporter, They know that I'm not going to let them go. I don't want them alone. I fear that. Not only were his kids important, but so was the ring. And he was sure he could win another world title more than seven years later. Now, while Chacon was having to deal with the trauma of losing his wife, Rafael Lamont, found himself in another world title fight against the big puncher from the Philippines who had just destroyed Bozer Edwards in five rounds to claim the WBC Super Featherweight title and that was Rolande Navarrete who was 43, 8 and 3. Well, the new champ who was making his second defence was not convinced by his next challenger, Limon, saying that I respect Limon as a human being but I don't respect his ability. Choi, as in the South Korean, he made his first defence against, is a tougher opponent, he said. It will be a close fight, but 
if it goes the distance, if we both slug it out, it won't go the distance and it will be either him or me. Well, the fight is a great fight. It took place at the Aladdin in Las Vegas and the Associated Press described the action. Two halves, which is basically what it was. Luca Limon, trailing all three judges' scorecards, landed 13 unanswered punches to knock out Rolando Navarrete at the 3 minutes and 10 of the 12th round and regain his WBC Junior Lightweight Championship. Limon started his barrage in the warning seconds of, of the 12th round. A left by the southpaw, back Navarrete into a neutral corner. Two right-left combinations put Navarrete penned in and from there Limon landed four rights and three lefts to the head. The last left sent Navarrete to the canvas as the bell rang and referee Joey Curtis then counted him out. It's a stunning fight, it really is. Under the Nevada rules, the bell could not save the Filipino. I think it's only the 12th round. It was the uh, 15th, sorry, back then. It was competitive throughout, but Limon was not going to let his chance go of well, that world title slip from his grasp as he had now become a two-time world champion. Limon made his first defence against the bad boy, Chung Lee Choi. Now, this is the guy that Navarrete had beaten in his first defence. Again, another great fight, who demonstrated his talent, but was eventually stopped at the Olympic Auditorium after Limon's persistence attacks. The Filipino that was actually given, this is on a side note, given this nickname after serving time behind bars for a sex offence, apparently. So that's why it's called Bad Boy. Limon's next defence would be against Bobby Shikom. And if the bad blood wasn't already there, it was now. ABC bought the fight and Shikom began in preparation at the Washington neighbourhood gym in Los Angeles, while Limon sparred with a young Julio Cesar Chavez. The pair shared a genuine hatred for each other with Lemon branding Chicon, the pampered pretty boy pre-fight, whilst the Chicano expressed his contempt for the Mexican calling him an arrogant prick. However, it was the Mexican who began the early mind games by complimenting Chicon. Bobby wasn't convinced, and he said he might be acting like he likes me, but I don't believe him. He also said there was bad blood between us. There was no way I can lose this fight. I've been working so damn hard. I thought to myself, if I lose, where am I going? I had to win. Bobby Chacon later described his emotions openly and he said, I didn't like that guy to begin with. And with everything that had happened, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I just kept thinking about Valerie. I cried for days. She came to me in my dreams. I would cry and then I would finally sleep. She came to me, beautiful as always, maybe to say goodbye. Clearly still struggling with his wife's death, Limon disgustingly told Chicon that his wife was in hell and he would be taking him there also. Now the fight was promoted by none other than Mr Slippery Don King who had also promoted the Michael Dokes against Mike Weaver fight the previous night in Las Vegas. They squared off on December the 11th 1982 on a Sunday afternoon edition of ABC's Wide World of Sports, with Keith Jackson on commentary duty. This was the only fight between the two where a world title was up for grabs. Can you believe that? Due to their third fight ending controversially, the odds makers made Limon the favourite. The Memorial Auditorium in Sacramento was the setting which was filled with thousands of Chicanos. Just after 2pm, the fighters made their way to the ring. The crowd roared loudest when Chicon was announced and booed Limon. Their fourth fight would prove to be the most entertaining spectacle of the series. So moving into the fight and um, from the opening bell, it was apparent to those watching on that they were in for a treat and be lucky enough to witness another war. Now, usually a slow starter, Limon began landing on Chacon almost immediately, working the body with enthusiasm with powerful hooks and whipped in punches from different angles. The champion had started the brighter of the two and forced a fierce pace and throwing looping shots to the head and the body. Limon worked behind the jab. When he closed the distance, he often landed as well. The champion was on the front foot, but when Limon did jump into the chest, he was peppered with flicking jabs. 
In the second round, Lemon pinned Shikon against the ropes and attacked him to the head and body, landing with every punch in the manual, but Shikon weathered the storm and returned fire with a series of stiff right hands to break free and sent the Mexican fleeing. This ignited a roar of expectation from the crowd. However, Limon had dominated the first three rounds, which concluded with 20 seconds remaining in the third. A counter straight left hand caught the challenger off guard and put him to the canvas. The Mexicans scored a knockdown in the fight. It was a flash knockdown, but it was a knockdown nevertheless. Into rounds four, all the way up to ten. And Chacon bled from cuts around his nose and eye in the fourth round, but through adversity he began his comeback. Chacon gritted his teeth, shook off a hellish body attack and opened a crossfire onslaught wherever he could. At times, Chacon used Limon for a speed bag rattling bazooka from corner to corner and more than once seeming on the verge of a stoppage win. But Limon was as tough as a flinthead and his highly developed sense of machismo not only kept him vertical, but it also drove him to taunt Chicon at every opportunity. Lemon dominated the first three, but Chicon had identified a flaw that had significance in the later rounds. He was having great success with the straight rights. He always hit the target time and time again. Lemon's downfall was his tendency to stand slightly square on, which allowed Chicon to land that streaking right. The pace never dipped throughout the fight and every round was close, but it was Limon who sneaked back in front, taking the seventh. Although Chicon managed to get the upper hand in rounds eight and nine, chipping away at Limon's midsection and progressively exhausting the Mexican, the champion continued to throw menacing shots from every angle, and eventually dropped the challenger for a second time with a counter left, this time seriously. The dramatic Chicon comeback had suffered a setback in the tenth, and with it, he must have fought his chances of world title glory again. Yeah, I mean, that was that, that knockdown. He fought so hard to get back into that, and that knockdown really did cripple him, but he didn't stop him. Shakon moving into 11 to 14 now. Shakon was not one to give up, and he, he launched another furious comeback. And it really is a stunning the way he comes back from that knockdown. Despite bleeding heavily from a deep cut on the bridge of the nose, again, Con threw. Everything but the kitchen sink following the, the uh, second knockdown. His bodywork in the middle stages began to play dividends and he clocked up rounds 11 and 12 while Limon hang on and he just hung on basically. He was tired and he backpedaled. Chacon had never been past 10 rounds, but here he was in the 12th, furiously whipsawing blows against Limon whose reputation for stamina and endurance was one of the surest things in boxing. The ferocity of the brawl was epitomised in the 13th round when each fighter staggered the other during a single exchange. It was a furious back-and-forth battle where both men were rocked in almost every round. Heading into the 14th, the outcome looked destined for the scorecards. Given the competitiveness throughout, it boiled down to who finished the stronger of the two. Although Chacon had earned his share of the rounds and was closing the show in style, the earlier knockdowns for Limon could not be discounted. And into the final round, round 15. When the bell rang for the 15th round, the fight was still in the balance, even though Chacon had suffered two knockdowns. But the champ was exhausted, and Bobby knew it. He closed the gap with a strong final push. The pace in the 15th was remarkable, as both men hammered each other relentlessly. Finally, with less than 20 seconds remaining, a weary Limon reached out, uncoordinated now, reflexes gone now, and remained frozen momentarily in front of Chicon, who crashed home a right hand that sent him stutter-stepping into retreat. Chicon launched another right, and Limon crashed to the mat, landing on his side, his head coming to rest beneath the bottom rope. It was a miracle that Limon could beat the count, and it was another miracle that the bell saved him from further punishment. With literally 10 seconds to go in the final round, Chacon miraculously sent the Iron Chin Limon down in as dramatic a fashion as possible. Limon rose and the bell ended the fight. The knockdown made all the difference, 
and was the only knockdown Chacon scored in the four fight series. Well, Angel L. Guzman and Tomo Stu Tomihara's scorecards of 142 141 and 141 140 actually read in favour of Bobby Chacon by virtue of the extra point in those dying seconds. The third judge was Carlos Padilla, who saw Chacon win in the fight 143 141. And the majority draw verdict had been avoided by the finest of margins. The fight was over and the unanimous decision by a total of four points across the board went to Bobby Chacon. More than seven years after losing his featherweight tie, he was champion again. Chacon had fulfilled the promise he had made to his high school sweetheart and late wife, becoming a two-weight world champion. And he said in the ring that, this is dedicated to my wife. If only she could be here with me. Chacon made his way to the dressing room of Rafael Limon straight after the fight. And the former champion told him, I'm sorry about your wife. Take care of your children. The pair had knocked lumps out of each other for a total of 42 rounds. And the final chapter of their rivalry has given boxing fans one for the ages. And it had also taken an awful lot out of both of these warriors, as we will mention at the end of this. Now, the fight was actually named Fight of the Year by The Ring magazine and is widely considered the most exhilarating 15-round brawls in history. At the post-fight press conference, Chacon spoke movingly about his return to the top. He said, I won my first title when I was 22, but I gave the championship away. I had to get back. There was no way I could lose this fight. I told my wife, Valerie, to wait around. This was all I wanted. One more title. Valerie's pleas, boxing fans and journalists all sang from the same hymn sheet after the fourth battle. All urged him to stop. The Los Angeles Times wrote, This is it, for sure. Now that he has a world champion again, Bobby Chacon can finally hang up the gloves and bow out proudly and gracefully from the sport that cripples or kills those that stay on fight too long. For Bobby, it's time. He's 31 years old in a young man's division. He took a pretty good beating last Saturday in upsetting Bazooka Limon for the WBC Super Featherweight title, making weight is a major battle, and his three kids need him around in one piece. But Chacon has never been very good at retiring. He tried it about four times and it never worked. Even when his wife threatened to commit suicide, he couldn't quit. Even when his wife committed suicide, he couldn't quit. And he didn't quit. Mr. Slippery Don King was, of course, at the forefront of Bobby losing his world title outside the ring. He was supposed to make a first defence against the young up-and-comer Hector Macho Camacho. But the fight was cancelled and rescheduled numerous times, even on the day of the fight. Chacon had apparently agreed to fight Camacho for just over $200,000, but then he got a better deal of nearly $500,000 to rematch Cornelius Bozer Edwards. King complained to his cronies within the WBC and actually managed to get the champion stripped of his title. Jeff Levine, who handled Camacho, was happy. and He said, I thought the WBC would never get around to it, but I'm glad to see they finally lived up to their word. They gave Chacon three extensions after they said they would strip him. He signed a contract to fight Hector and then he pulled out. Well, the WBC, well, you know, now they've stripped him. They've got a title. Camacho's obviously vacant. Who did they give it to? Well, the vacant title is ordered for Rafael Limon to fight Hector Camacho for that vacant WBC world title. And the younger, fresher Puerto Rican, well, look, he absolutely demolishes the Mexican in five rounds before going on to enjoy, obviously, a highly successful campaign of his own. Limon fought another 13 times in 12 years, winning just three. Those duels that Limon had with Chacon, with Boza Edwards, Navarrete, he was never the same fighter. He lost to the likes of Julio Cesar Chavez, again, Rolando uh, Navarrete, once again, Roger Mayweather as well beat him. But his other defeats were against the less illustrious names as he fought on when he basically should have retired. Finally, in 1994, with a record of 52 wins, 23 defeats, two draws and 39 knockouts, he retired. I mean, that you look at that record, you'd think he's a rubbish fire. He really wasn't. 
he now happily resides back home in his country of Mexico. For all his wars, Bazooka Limon appears to still have all of his faculties. Talking to The Ring in 2018, he said that Bobby Chacon, or this of Bobby Chacon, he was a mad dog. Maybe it was because he was addicted to drugs, but all four fights with him were dog fights. I was able to knock him down in the first three fights, but he put me down in the fourth. Now we're going to end with Bobby, and despite no title on the line, the fight with the number one contender at the time was Cornelius Bowser Edwards, and that fight went ahead, and it was billed as the People's Champion. And on May 15, 1983, they engaged in a memorable rematch, another fantastic fight. Bobby Chacon once again was bloody on the verge of defeat and came fighting back to win a hard fought unanimous decision despite many rig side commentators actually calling for the bout to be stopped earlier to keep Chacon from taking any more punishment. It was also voted the 1983 fight of the year by Ring Magazine. So again, Chacon, two back-to-back fight of the years. And if you haven't seen this one, what are you waiting for? Get yourself on YouTube. It's another epic between these guys in a magical era of this division. The following year, Chacon was placed on probation for beating the second of his three wives and three years later was sentenced to six months in prison for violating the probation. He went in pursuit of another world title at a third weight, taking on Ray Mancini for the WBA World Lightweight title, but was knocked out inside three rounds by the popular Italian-American. Referee Richard Steele, who stopped the fight, said, Bobby had gotten enough. I wanted it to end with this great champion standing and smiling. Chacon said afterward, I'm still smiling, thank you. He fought seven more times. In fact, won all seven, including a 10-round points win, over Freddie Roach, but eventually called it a day in 1988 with a record of 59 wins, 7 defeats, 1 draw, and 47 knockouts. His life continued to be devastated by tragedy and alcoholism. His son, Bobby Jr., was murdered in a gang dispute in 1991, and his career earnings, including properties and assets, were squandered to the extent that he eventually faced bankruptcy. Bobby then unsurprisingly developed Dementia Pugilistica, which is known as Boxer Syndrome. He lived in a hospice and with family all the way through up until his death on September the 7th, 2016, after suffering a fall at his home. He was 64 years of age. In 2005, he was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. The president of the West Coast Boxing Hall of Fame, Ricky Farris, described Chacon in an interview as one of the most exciting fighters in the history of the West Coast, an amazing blood and guts brawler who took on the best fighters in three divisions. And we will end this episode with a quote from Bobby Chacon on boxing. And it goes, Fighting is like a wife, you know. It can be good if you treat it right. If you don't treat it right, it will know, because like a wife, it's with you all the time. And it's a pretty good way to end the tale of Chicon and Limon with a with a great quote from Bobby Chicon at the end there. And obviously we'll give our thoughts and, and feelings on this amazing tale between these two. What sort of a tale have we done before where, you know, the first fight of this tale doesn't really get spoken about that much because there's nothing there to be able to know much about it like it, like i said earlier it felt like we had to kind of brush over that first one a little bit because the, the the information is so limited that we were unable to be able to source any more information than what we got for it which is quite unusual for us because we're usually able to pull something from somewhere which relates to to the majority of these fights which is quite strange we've even pulled information from fights years before this somehow but unfortunately yeah. for the first fight we was unable to get the full information on it but for what we did get it kind of set the context of what was going to come and then fights two three and four were just a rivalry which surpassed many rivalries and i think it's a forgotten rivalry i think people don't necessarily remember the rivalry as such because you know it wasn't like there was a hatred in it and obviously there was some disgusting remarks about Valerie, you know, the fact that she was in hell and, you know, I'll be sending mm. you there with her kind of thing. Well, I thought that was a really harrowing moment. And I'm pretty sure Raphael Lamont probably regretted that down the line by saying something like that. But it, it was a great 
tale because it told us a tale of two guys that were, you know, they had so much adversity in their own boxing careers. And when you look at the records, like you read the records out, it doesn't necessarily, I suppose, reflect how good of a career they really had. I think in particular, when you look at Rafael Le Mans and you look at 23 defeats on his record and you think, well, this guy was a world champion. I think what people need to remember about fighters from these different areas that we cover is that they would fight the best. The best would always fight the best and it wouldn't matter, you know, who they fought. It wouldn't matter how many times they stepped up, they would fight the best. And if they lost, they lost. You know, it wasn't all about protecting that record in these different areas that we cover. It was for them it was all about just being a champion or trying to become a champion. And I think that's what's reflective of this particular story is you've got two guys here that were just vying to, to become world champions. Both successfully did at some point of their career. And it was also quite mad really to think that only one of their four fights ended up being for a world title. When you think of the tale, you think yeah. these these guys must have fought for the world title, you know, two or three times. But only once did they fight for a world title throughout the course of this tale. I thought that was quite amazing. But the fights, the three fights that you can access are on YouTube. And as we've said throughout the course of the episode, we implore you as listeners to go back and watch the series of fights because they're just amazing. It's just an amazing set of fights, which when you hear the stories that go with them through this episode, you get to really feel and understand how things were and how hard things must have been for both of these guys in different ways. Oh, mate, like everything you said, Dan, I mean, this is a shame we couldn't get anything on that first fight, but by the sounds of it, Limon pretty much batters him for, what, eight of those rounds. It's one of those ones where if I think Shakon wins, then maybe we never even know who Limon is. I think it's one of those because he could have just, he would have just continued on the Mexican scene. As soon as he beats Shakon, that fires him into the limelight, like, oh, who's this guy now? And then he goes on, on this magnificent run of his. But it's interesting, isn't it? How it's just it's in the it's in the Mexican ball ring. <laughs> I mean, that you it's just one of those small fights, and no one really expects anything from Limon, and and it fires him into the limelight. And I mean, their, their second fight, Bobby Chacon really does demonstrate his boxing skills, and it's like a fight that gets going, and then obviously. The, the stoppage just sort of it, it, it completely ruins that fight, if you like. Although some people still feel that it's one of the best seven rounds you're going to see, especially from Bobby. Great boxing. And then the third fight, I think Le Mans wins. I think most people who watch is, who watches that, are, you know, you don't, you don't see the first two rounds, but I think Le Mans should did, did deserve to take that. And then the, the fourth, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It really is. The, I think it's one of the greatest 15 rounders ever. Honestly, it's, it's, it's to and fro. There's knockdowns and then you get the dramatic ending. It's absolutely stunning. But I will say, I mean, the one thing I ended up doing from this, from doing these notes, was I found myself watching the all the, the fights, including Rosa Edwards and including Navarrete. We talk about the Fab Four, right? We talk about Hagler. We talk about Hearns, Duran, Leonard, and, and them guys are huge in the 80s. But if you wanted to, if you've, if you've not seen any of these fights, trust me, watch Limon Chacon. It's just the best, especially their fourth at standing. But watch the Bose Redwoods fight. Watch Navarrete fights. And literally, you can you can watch them and they beat each other and then one takes the title from the other. It is unbelievable. The fights are insane. I mean, I can't even tell you enough. Like, it's so much fun to watch them. I mean, it's devastating because <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. How they, the, the defensive work ain't really there at times, but it's insane. It really is. And, and it also demonstrates just how bloody good Alexis Arguello is as well, because he dealt with all of these guys. But yeah, look, it's a great tale. I mean, all for what happened to Shikon's wife really was tragic. And yeah, not nice from Limon to say he's going to send her to send him to hell like her kind of thing. That weren't nice. Yeah, look, I hope you enjoyed it, guys. As as we said, the information is limited, but there is a tale there, and it is it, if it if it does implode, just do one thing, just to go back and watch these four guys, watch these four fights, or the three of them. And then watch the rest of the Boza and the Navarrete stuff after, because I'm telling you, it's a night of fun just watching these guys. Yeah, this is this is what we like to sort of direct you to go and do, really, because like when we when we look at these episodes and when we put all these episodes together, we do it in mind of of what we can actually source for the episodes. And when you've got all these sort of supporting 
axe, as in like you, the exactly, Bowser Ed, you've yeah. got the Bowser Edwards fights, you've got the Roland Navarrete fights, and you've got all these other supporting actors that play a part in this tale. You know, it is definitely worth going back and looking at it. And I think the point you're trying to make is like when you put them names into it, they're like the Fab Four of the seventies, aren't they? Like when you they look are. at you look at Limon, Chicon, Roland Rolando Navarrete, and then you've got Bowser Edwards in there as well. They are like the Fab Four of the nineteen seventies when you put all them together. Throw into the mix Alexis Arguello, as you rightly pointed out, and you could even have a Fab Five there as well. But it's been really enjoyable tale a really different tale for us to cover something that you know we'd not done anything on these two guys before and it's always a pleasure when we introduce new fighters to the show and the history of these fighters to the show because it always leads on to what more we can do to present you these fighters in different ways so like you've got career profiles that we can do on both of these fighters at some point down the line where we can focus solely on getting information on their early beginnings, a lot more stories that we can put into those episodes. So it bodes well for, for future episodes as well. So some information that we can get doesn't always necessarily get stuck into these episodes because we want you to listen to career profiles as well. And we want you to come over and get a full and complete picture there as well. So we hope you've enjoyed this tale, the tale of Bobby Chicon and Raphael Lamont. And if you have, please do let us know on social media at Legend Night Pod on Twitter or the BTR Boxing Podcast Facebook page, the Instagram page, or if you're watching slash listening on YouTube, drop a comment in the box below. Let us know your memories of this. Let us know your thoughts and feelings of this episode. We really do appreciate it. A final shout out to the patrons of this podcast. Thank you so much for supporting us across this journey that we're on. We appreciate the love and support that you're giving us to help us build this platform up even bigger. And in return, you've had early access to this episode and you've not had to listen to any ads during the course of it as well. And if you're not a patron, but you're listening and wondering, what do we do there? Check it out on patreon.com forward slash BTR Boxing Podcast and you will see that we do patron only content. We release video content that we don't release out to the public. So there is a lot of other benefits of being a patron of the network. So please do go and check that out as well. That's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to the tale of Bobby Chicon and Raphael Lemon.